Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to HR Katha Presents Happiness at Work, powered by happiness.me. With this new episode, we continue with our journey to find the pearls of happiness in the life of a professional and at the workplace. In each episode, we speak to a corporate leader whose job entails maintaining a happy workforce and a happy culture. Today, we have Ruhi Pandey, CHRO Godrej Housing Finance, as our guest for the afternoon. Ruhi, with a great career graph spanning over two decades, has worked with some of the best known companies in India, Mariko, Kaya, Reliance, NIIT, and ITC. She has handled HR for organizations at various growth phases, changes, and transformations. Ruhi, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me over. So what comes to your mind when I say, uh, you know, happiness at the workplace? Does it mean a place full of cheerful people where, you know, there is a good camaraderie among all and there is no office politics? Do you think that is too good to be true? Is it uh, achievable? Well, life can't be all, all a bed of roses. But uh, and if you ask me uh, the definition of uh, happiness, I guess it's an end state. Uh, when you believe that uh, the work you do is meaningful, when you believe that the work you do is challenging, uh, when when you go into work feeling motivated, looking forward to the kind of job content which you have. And yes, I mean, very importantly, when you think that the people you are working with, whether it's your managers or the leadership or your peers or your team, are all there committed to make... Uh, you know, life better for the customers uh, when you believe that the sole motivation and purpose of everyone is to come in and help each other. The end product of all that is happiness. Happiness is an okay. end state. When you do many things right, you get this feeling within yourself, which is called happiness. So suppose if you are, you know, you, if you are watching from outside, I'm saying you're, you're watching as a third person, you know. So if you enter a workplace or it you know, would you be able to say that, you know, this is a happy workplace or this isn't a happy work workplace? So what and how would you differentiate between the two, you know? Right. So, well, I'm I'm actually an organization psychologist to that extent. Uh, uh, I would like to believe that my antennas would be higher than anyone else. But yeah. yes, I mean, even now when you're when we are doing as management, when we go over to our locations to do visits, site visits, when you walk into a workplace, when you walk into a retail store, you get that vibe. You get that feeling that people look engaged. People are motivated. Everyone's looking interested. People have smiles on their faces. There's a general buzz. You know, you when you, uh, I mean, uh, for example, you go to a restaurant, one restaurant over the other. You enter one restaurant, you feel that, you know, the entire environment There's is electric. Vibe, yeah. Another restaurant you go, you see disinterested faces, drooping shoulders. And you'll say, oh, my God, you know, people here are not really happy. They're not motivated. People here are happier. So, yeah, there are these uh, instant uh, mechanisms of picking up. And I think every human being is attuned to pick up energy in their uh, um, environment. So you can pick up organizations or environments which are engaged. So you see, you mean to say the energy is very important. And once anybody who enters that workplace would feel that energy probably. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, you know, uh, you know, happiness has a very different uh, value proposition for different sets of people. Uh, you know, does it also vary as per organizations or as per I would say the make of the organization? You know, you have worked across sectors and companies. Uh, what has been your experience? You know, you have worked with a multinational company. You have worked with an Indian, uh, you know, business conglomerate. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, you must have had a different uh, kinds of experiences. So Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I don't know whether happiness would vary with the industry. I think happiness is about the set of employees who are, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're individuals. We are wired in a particular manner. We need to feel that sense of belongingness to the organization or to a community. We need to feel that sense of purpose especially the millennials these days, you know, they come into work, not to work, they come into work to contribute. 
every uh, individual needs some time off from work to pursue their hobbies, to pursue something else and ensure that there is downtime. So I don't think it varies basis uh, organizations. I think what's important is for leadership and human resources teams in every organization to find out what drives and motivates their people. So, uh, you know, because every organization would have a very set, different set of demographic. You'd hire a different cohort of uh, education. You'd hire from different institutes. You'd hire different people. So what drives and makes your people happy? Is it uh, are the people coming into work to get great rewards? Is it very important to them that their managers are great people? So there are certain commonalities and there would be certain things which will be very specific to the industry. As long as the HR team and the leadership team knows that these are the few drivers and runs constant uh, listening surveys through engagement, through conversations, through skip sessions, through leadership connects, and you keep getting this data time to time again, and it can't be one-time dipstick. You can't say, okay, once in a year, I find out whether my people are happiness and then I'll leave them for the year. You know, so constant touch points, moodometers, surveys, they are really the need of the hour. And if you keep checking what's happening, what's kind of making them motivated, what's kind of disengaging them, and keep working on it. I mean, uh, just to give you an example, the entire thing around the pandemic, we, know, we never knew that that's going to hit us. But yeah. everything else being constant, that made a lot of, uh, that caused a lot of unhappiness. People got anxious. People didn't, uh, there was uncertainty in the environment. And but I guess organizations uh, worked around it. Uh, the organizations transformed themselves. They understood what their employees needed. And in such time, everyone was able to constantly keep touching base with employees and doing their best. You all always don't have all the answers. But if you yeah. know what motivates your people, if you have these listening checks in place, as long as your employees know that you care and you are on it, and even if you don't have 100% of the solutions, 100% of the time, you will have a happy workplace. But, you, you know, you say, suppose I, I, you know, generally in this uh, interview that we do, you know, we would like people to share a lot of, uh, you know, their experiences, anecdotes. So, you know, you have worked with ITC, you have worked with Mariko, you have worked with Godrej. I'm, I'm saying currently you are with Godrej. So, uh, do you see any kind of difference in the, the happiness quotient between the three companies, you know, and, and especially when you are at the helm of affairs where, you know, your job entails that, you know, to keep the workforce happy. That's 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 probably part of your care. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Prajul Fortune, I mean, frankly, fortunately speaking, the three organizations you've named, uh, I've, I've, I've just been blessed, all three of them. Mm -hmm. I've seen that people, they really care about their employees in varied ways. Everyone's yeah. got a very different way of operating. ITC was a lot about the purpose. You know, yeah. they they stood so big, widely for the kind of purpose and the impact they were making that their employees were engaged in a different manner. Mariko, again, a very different organization. If you'll ask about Godrej, I would say that there are a few things which we really focus on in my current organization. I think okay. culture is one thing we've gone out to. And we I'm a part of a startup right now, at least for the last two odd years. Prior to yeah. that, I was working with Godrej Properties, a much larger organization. So I think... What we constantly keep focusing on is the cultural tenets. What is the kind of culture we want to create? Focusing on four or five pillars, you know, ensuring that the culture of the place is constantly experienced by the employees. It's not on a plaque on the wall. And, you know, again, like I said, running dipsticks, having constant engagements. Um, employees want purpose in their lives. So what's the purpose of your organization? How can each role holder feel constantly feel that constantly he or she is contributing that purpose. So, for example, if you ask about us, our, our purpose of Godrej Housing Finance is unlocking yeah. what's important to you through fair, flexible, and fast financing. So, we believe that for the customer, we will unlock their potential through providing fast financing. So, as long as each role holder understands how am I contributing to that purpose, I think that makes the, uh, the bunch very uh, agile and that makes them very happy. Uh, if you're able to... Have these constant open houses, communication. Get your CEOs to talk to people, travel. Of course, travel has been kind of curtailed, but now that uh, things have started opening up, we've started going and connecting with people. In fact, I recently wrote an article about how, how many ever surveys you do, whatever conceptual frameworks you have, there's nothing which can 
match the simple thing of going down to the gemba which is where the marketplace of your employees is and talking to them it gives them a huge high and understanding what are small small issues which might be irritating them if you can show showcase to them that you care you are agile about solving their problems believe me they'll give it their 150% to contribute to a uh, to the customer right and last but not the least uh, the leadership i are you all are your leaders walking the talk when you say you care for people are you making time out are you do you have time to listen to your people uh, as long as your employees know they are empowered they are growing they are connected with the purpose the leadership cares the outcome will be happiness and to answer the question uh, all these three things in many meaningful ways have made their employees very happy okay but uh, you know uh, say you know at godrej housing finance you know yeah. we, you know, there there would be companies where you know you you have got you know a large proportion of employees sitting under one roof you know it is much more easier to manage but for a yeah. you know uh, for a company like godrej housing finance you will have small pockets yes. offices spread across yeah. the city and each offices will have their own unique problems or you know yeah. very uh, could be a, a, you know a differentiated or, or culture i am saying there would be one culture but every every office will have their own nuances or small typical problems you know how do you ensure uh, you know that oneness in terms of happiness all across in the branch right so, oh no that's a very important these are small pocket teams you know it's yeah no no that's a very important question because often times what happens and i've not never worked in a startup this is my first experience so the founders come in with a very clear thought process think this is the values these are the culture and when the scale up of an organization happens sometimes that culture breaks because of these exactly the way you said that at the head mm-hmm. office the culture is different something else at the ground so i think three four ways of doing that is the most important and i can't go away from the importance of this is who are you hiring your the recruitment okay. process of an organization if done well actually sorts for 70% of the issues if you end up recruiting wrong leaders the impact is far higher but the amount of time you can spend on perfecting your hiring process get getting selection down to a science the higher are the chances of you achieving that success and now that i worked in a startup we've created everything from scratch i was the first employee of the organization so there are responsibility okay. as well on my shoulders and i feel happy that we were able to achieve it so getting the right cultural fit uh, if you believe that the value or the culture of your organization is to respect your employees then you have to hire leaders who will respect employees not just create great revenues for you and that's where actually some of these uh, breakdowns happen so going after ensuring you get the right set of people secondly when you know that you are uh, going to be dispersed like our we currently are present in five locations those locations will grow how, how how are you onboarding people how are you assimilating people do people understand your values and that does not mean that you create online modules which can be run and experienced by people you got to t- get your leaders to talk about them you have yes. to have stories so our md talks about this very beautiful concept of saying what is the value and what's the virtue i'll give you a small example for example a v- value of our says show respect so we say that each there's e- equality you know each employee is important there's no one who's senior there's no one who's junior the virtue there is that we are all on first name basis unlike the industry we don't have a sir ma'am culture you know respect each person for okay. the work they do not by calling them ma'am or sir uh, our cabins are transparent a lot of our leaders actually sit outside so we constantly keep making forums and opportunities to have informal catch ups with you know our frontline teams and it starts by the md it starts with the managing committee so that's how you break down your value of show respect so how are you assimilating your leaders so that they totally understand what you're saying last but not the least you got to empower people you may say all these things and you may say employees are very important but when the business head sitting out of your south region wants to approve five six cabs on an evening where all women work late and he doesn't have the authority that's when the breakdown will happen so if right. one of our values says be entrepreneurial so that entrepreneurial means that take your call if this was your business what would you do we are very clear that safety of our of our employees is of paramount importance thereby empowering the local leadership is critical and one of the things we've started doing from a very early stage we've got hr business partners embedded in the regions 
even when the number of people were low, we could have had a chance. We could have said, no, we want to run HR from the center. But we don't think HR is a central function. It's got to partner business. The people have to be in tune. The HR person has to be available as an employee champion at their location for people to go and speak. Uh, so these five, six things we've been doing, backed up with constant listening, you will be able to create a uh, culture which is experienced commonly across. Yeah, but you made a very interesting point. You know, Generally, I have seen people talking about, when they talk about culture fit, they talk about you know, employees who, who are at the grassroots level or, or the new hires or, or you know, employees who, who are at the junior level. That, that's where they talk about the culture fit. But you talked about the culture fit of leadership, you know, that, that's, that's very interesting. So how do you, how do you, you know, identify, say, say you were the first employee, you know, Probably this, you got this opportunity or, uh, you know, to find the culture fit, fit of leadership because, you know, you were the first employee of, of the of the yeah. organization. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So how do, yeah. you, how do you find the culture fit of the leadership? You know, generally yeah. what happens is an organization, the leader is already there, you know, and then you start, it, it's like a pyramid, you know. You start hiring from the top and then you start going down and yeah. Yeah. down and down. No, I, I think both models exist and uh, I've, I've kind of worked uh, in both the situations where I joined yeah. an organization and there's already a full leadership team available and then or, or in a situation which is actually very unique, which I find myself yeah. in right now. And in both the models, I think the impact is multifold if you hire wrong at the leadership because that leader will also hire people under them. Yes. And then if you don't hire right, that individual will then do hiring, which is basis their own values and not to say any value is wrong or any individual is wrong. It's just about a fit. What works somewhere else may not work with us. So I think the most important thing is for us to understand what are we looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for, it'll be very difficult for. So having a common uh, understanding of what are going to be some of the non-negotiable values. Uh, what are going to be some of the non-negotiable capabilities, apart from just ensuring that the person is great at the business they do, which you will do. What are some of the things uh, which which you will uh, look at? Is the person very agile? Would you look at people who are very respectful? Would you look at people who are team leaders, who have demonstrated in the past the ability to build teams, run teams well? And uh, how do you find them? I guess you find them, uh, you uh, understand. So we have two, three ways of doing it. One is, of course, a lot of organizations use psychometric assessments. We do the same too, and especially at the yeah. leadership level. It tells us about the, uh, we've, we've kind of got a multiple uh, host of tests. It tells you about fundamental intelligence. It tells you about the cultural fit, your capability factors. And then, of course, you go around doing interviews. So we are trained ourselves in doing good interviews, yeah. structured interviews. We train our leaders in uh, interviewing skills. And then you got to spend that kind of time. That in that one, one and a half hours of interview needs to be rich. You need to understand that individual as a person, what drives them, what are their motivators, uh, why are they joining you. And then once you're very clear that this person brings the skill, here are five things this individual is very good at and maybe one or two where someone will need to chip in. You need to get them on. Uh, yeah, you won't you you get, get everything in, in one person, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you won't get one thing in every and yeah. and that's how you build diverse teams. You will say, okay, I've got like a bunch of five people. This is the leadership team. Two are very good at this. You get complementary skills, and finally, that's how you are unleashing the power of the team. In an organization which is already running, and you've got a set of leadership team, and um, you know you've got your cultural values aligned. Obviously, you will have to listen, and you'll have to understand. You'll have to look at data. How is that person doing well? What are the team engagement scores? What are the value scores? Are there any pockets of challenges? And if there are, then obviously you will have conversations to understand where are they going yes. wrong? Is it a training issue? Is it a, is, does it mean that the leadership has to be advised appropriately? And accordingly, kind of take it ahead. Yeah, if there is a building where the foundation is already done, it is very difficult to change the pillars, actually. So. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, yeah. I would say that it's not absolutely difficult. People need to understand the alignment. They need yeah. to understand what's going to work in an organization and then people change. And the biggest problem, I think, is the acceptability. You know, the leaders need to accept that there, there is a requirement for a change, which many a yes. times don't happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So they need to understand, they need to see the logic in the change. When people connect with the reason for the changes, when they'll actually change. Otherwise, it's got to be a lot of lip service. Yeah, many times the problem is that they think they are perfect, but you know, there is problem somewhere else. <laughs> That's human nature, unfortunately. Yeah. I know, I agree. Tell me something, you know, there are there are organizations, you will you will find many of them uh, currently, you know. There are certain organizations, very, very aggressive organizations in terms of business goals, in terms of capturing businesses, or in terms of even even in terms of uh, you know. They're very aggressive in nature in terms of growth, you know, whether in terms of, in, it could be in terms of business acquisition, it could be in terms of customer acquisitions, because they want to scale new heights very soon, very fast. Yeah, yeah. You know, at these workplaces, are they happier workplaces or do you think these places are less happier than probably, you know, an organization which believes in slow pace of growth, people could be little, you know, slow paced yeah. And, yeah. and taking it easy. Yeah. I, I don't, and like I said, you will find a lot of, lot of uh, examples and a lot of organizations. Yeah. Yeah. But fortunately, days, yeah. you know, the companies I worked in uh, have balanced both. And I think there has to be a balance because organizations eventually exist to make business sense. When businesses grow, employees grow, stakeholders grow, you have to create value. You are, prefer, you know, prof, all organizations which are working for profit are there to create uh, value for yes. its stakeholders. And I also feel that employees get excited when growth happens. I personally feel, I'll just give you a small example for something we've created. And we've actually yes. just been an organization which has grown very fast. We just started out about, uh, you know, I think we've, about a 10, 12 odd months back, we just completed a year of actual business existence and we've scaled up fast. So, uh, and but then how do you do it? So in order to excite our employees, we created a platform called Level Up. We said, henceforth, okay. the demand for numbers is going up. We are getting into multiple segments. We started out as one product. Now we are in multiple products. The team's growing, locations are growing. And here's your Level Up. Create motivation, created energy, created a reason as to how are we going to, Break it down and saying, how are we going to do it? Constant communication, good rewards and recognition. Saying, you know, these are the these are the milestones. We are going to constantly keep communicating. If you're able to create an amazing story about your growth, people feel very proud. They feel excited. In fact, I think employees love organizations which have an appetite for growth. The only thing to kind of uh, watch, uh, be a little watchful for about is that we don't burn out employees. So that, at the And that's of, what is happening. You know, I have yeah. heard about Many cases, you know, there is one, you know, large edtech company. There is one large fintech company, you know. Right. They right. have been growing like anything, you know, much yeah. faster than what people had accepted. Because right. people are, employees are not able to keep up with the pace of growth, which probably the investors had, uh, you know, anticipated or the investors want or the founders want, you know, and that creates a very, you know, high pressured environment, which makes the environment toxic. Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. and that's a fact. You... Yeah, uh, I'm unable to uh, comment, you know, at the end of the day, I'm yeah. sure that there will be people in that organization. But my, my yeah. two bits on that is that that growth is not sustainable. Growth which burns out employees will lead to attrition. And then it becomes a revolving door. And I've been a part of an organization which scaled up really fast. People got burnt out. And then it went round and round. And the second thing which could happen potentially, uh, which is a watch out, is when you put a lot of target pressure on your employees, customer service gets compromised. And which again in the long term is not sustainable because when you start compromising on customers, employees at the end of the day will take some shortcuts. If what you yes. are expecting them, if you're expecting them to do something which is not easy to do, which is perhaps not broken down into how. Uh, they will start using their own thought process. They will start taking shortcuts and that's not good in the long run. So growth is good, but a growth which is calibrated, which is sustainable and which does not compromise on the well-being of the employees. I think that's the kind of growth which employees love. They will be extremely energized and to answer the first question we started off with, that would actually create happiness. Growth for employees, have, growth for business, but well-being. So have realistic goals. That is what you want to say. Probably, you know, 
that will keep the workforce happier yeah yeah realistic is actually a very subjective word i i would say yeah. that sustainable sustainable growth yeah. okay yeah yeah tell me something you know that's uh, do you think uh, you know once professional success uh you know contributes to happiness at the workplace you know how important is that you know professional success you know we it might be you know a place where we go you know we have got a good you know camaraderie among the team members everything is going on but unless i achieve you know if i don't see professional growth happening will i be a happy you know employee uh growth is very important if you ask me growth can be of multiple ways uh there are organizations where uh, you know the career ladders are very fast so there are multiple positions or grades which are created giving the feeling that people are growing year on right. year and that's not wrong there are there are organizations which work very well uh, you know with that frame i would say uh, growth is very important but growth would be of two kinds uh, if you are able to articulate to your employees what are the learning what's the growth in their personal learning journeys uh you know creating things like your individual development plans having conversations with their supervisors giving them coaching learning and training opportunities so that they feel okay there's some skill which is added secondly when growth happens is there something significant in terms of responsibility which is getting added have they truly grown in the contribution to the organization so if you're able to combine both uh growth then doesn't come at the cost of saying that uh, you know i suddenly grew and i wasn't able to be successful if you are able to yeah. handhold your employees to guide them through this entire growth curve i would say that it's critical it's very critical personally for me the professional growth uh, is equally important i think we as professionals uh, what can truly create happiness for us is definitely how happy we are in our personal lives but professional and personal now are actually all entwined it's the same individual going across both so if i'm happy at my workplace it will have a huge impact on the kind of happiness i i have at my personal workplace as well so definitely very very important thing is uh, professional growth so but but tell me something you know as uh, you know uh, as a professional who is you know whose job is to ensure that that the hap- you know the workplace stays happy how do you ensure personal happiness and and you are saying that to have an implication at the workplace happiness you know if somebody is yeah. not happy personally yeah. you know but how yeah. do you ensure yeah yeah you know personal happiness among employees it's is you know it's not in your control yeah. It's, it's, hey, oh, yeah. ensuring personal happiness is not in our hands the point i was trying to make is that your professional success contributes to your overall happiness yes now having said that the organization is an organization we can't shirk away from the responsibility and yeah. you know i was just giving you the example of a pandemic it happens in many other cases also that there may be challenges a employee is facing in their personal lives it could be things yeah. around you uh, know many things at the personal it could be relationships it could yeah. be uh, you know for women young children managing yeah, career any, anything, uh, anything. yeah many things now um, organizations are going beyond so for example we have something which uh, which is a counseling service we provide to our employees and their families it's free of course it's totally confidential uh, employees can pick up the phone and talk to trained counselors and looking at the way we are right now none of us are staying with our families people are all in nuclear families lots of people yeah. stay alone they need to talk to someone and we do provide that facility so if if folks need a sounding board they need to share something which uh, which they're not able to share in the personal lives they are able to share there secondly you know just this entire concept of uh, now your workplace is not only a workplace it's also a social place you have a lot of friends yeah. at work a bunch of my team members i know go out for lunch every day and they really miss that they used to keep telling me please call us to work i used to keep and telling them it happens in india i think you know that social workplace yeah. it's a reality in india it's a reality in india you have friends yeah. at the workplace yeah. so just chat catching up for coffee going out for a lunch going out for dinner etc uh how are you able to create opportunities where people can just get together unwind whether it's fun at work small parties and with with the pandemic it's difficult but if it's virtual parties if it's reward and recognition yeah. you're creating these opportunities where employees can come forget their uh, personal realities and just relax so i think that would be the second thing and the third of course is to create a 
uh, uh, you know, a kind of a safe workplace uh, where employees can come and feel we are safe, safe from the pandemic, safe from uh, any kind of harassment at work. So having your committees in place, having ombudsman helplines, having a system of grievance. So even if an employee feels upset about something, they know that there is someone they can reach out to. And if you ask me, Prajwal, amongst all the coachings I do, amongst the multiple employee conversations I do, it's never happened that the employee only spoke about their profession. 30-40% of their conversations yeah. are about their personal life, saying, you know, I have this kid at home, this is a challenge. And just listening to them, sharing your own experiences, telling them that they're not alone. There are many people who have gone through this. I think it goes a long way. So you're saying organizations should take step, you know, when... You know, if they're able to find out that a you know, certain employee is going through a personal crisis, they should intervene and offer help. Yes, they should. It's sometimes organizations think that, you know, it is not, you know, in our purview, why should we get into, you know, somebody's yeah. personal life, you yeah. know? Yeah, I, I guess it's a very fine, uh, I mean, it's a fine balance one has oh, to because yeah. you don't want to encroach on the employee's life. But just the employee knowing that if there is something which is required, it's available. And in fact, this entire awareness about mental well-being has been all about yeah. that, right? When you're seeing signs right in front of your eyes that the employee is not behaving, what are you going to do? Hope that the person gets sorted out and it's personal, so I'm not going to do anything. And then something goes wrong. Uh, just, you know, you won't show whether those signs were what you saw. And if you had reported, something else would have happened. Or simply go and tell someone that, look, I think this person needs some help. Can somebody intervene? And then have professionals step in. I mean, we are not all trained to be counsellors, yeah. but you have a bunch of counsellors. You can offer that. If the employee doesn't want to take it beyond a point, you can't force them. But just having that available. So do you, do you have you seen, you know, a change in this regard, you know, in the last many years? You know, probably when you started, you know, especially in interpersonal skills, the yeah. interpersonal relationships you know do, you, do yeah. you see a change in interpersonal relationships you know since when you started and now when you see you know people much younger junior yeah. no i do see i i see a huge amount of change in the newer workforce their aspirations the way they are wired their uh need to contribute to the purpose their need to do meaningful work like i said they don't want to come and work they want to come and contribute the way managers need to deal with such people because they don't give respect on a platter. At some yeah. stage of time, and maybe I was at a very early stage in my career, respect was expected. Uh, yes. Respect was expected. I mean, just because I'm your boss, you would respect me. And it was hierarchical. So you would say things and stuff would get done. Now, these people have ideas and that they'd like to be heard. And their ideas are amazing. Uh, so you need to kind of, so you have to harness their energies as well as kind of make them uh, be a part. So the work of uh, the management, the work of the leadership, I would say slightly, the expectations are slightly higher. The ask, as you go higher the ladder, how a leader should be able to operate is slightly higher. There's no one size fits all formula. You need to look at each individual case in itself and see how I need to be treated, how I need to, what brings out the best in me is not what brings out the best in you. So identifying what each one's, um, uh, you know, motivators are and then working according to that, I would say that that really goes a long way. But yet there is definitely a shift in uh, the workplace. It, it's actually totally transformed. You see, you see there is, there's certainly been a change in way in the, in the interpersonal relationship between the boss and the subordinate, you know. But among colleagues, has there been a change in terms of interpersonal uh, relationships? The way, you know, probably... You know, we yeah, would, I, I would have say, behaved with our co-workers yeah, yeah. than I would it is say, now. I would say because the organization structures have evolved. Uh, earlier, the structures used to be very rigid. They would be far more functional. Business-led yeah. structures have come in, which are more about cross-functional teams, which are about self-directed teams, where, you know, there's a bunch of people who are expected to deliver projects. They are deliver, delivering project uh, products. And everything has to be very seamless. So... When one function end, ends and the other function starts, there's like a passing of the baton. So yeah. in such structures and the way uh, the organizations are now far more boundaryless, they are nimble, they're agile, the speed is far higher than what it used to be earlier. 
obviously uh, your the need to collaborate is far higher then that's why uh, things like peer recognition 360 feedback all those things are yeah. very important so there is definitely a shift in way, the way people collaborate with their peers as well okay so do you think you know we can uh, formulate or adapt a strategy to keep the workplace happy you know what would be the key ingredients in that case i'll go back to the first point i made in my opinion happiness is an outcome and there are it's like you know the final dish coming and getting served in front of you and there are multiple things which go into it so identifying what those multiple things for your organization are and that that would vary uh, it would vary on the business strategy it would vary on the kind of talent you have mm -hmm. and some things would be very common people want to be respected people want to contribute people want uh, work life balance but what are the other things uh, uh, uh and you know and that all will come from your business strategy what kind of people are you trying to attract so for example for us the four five pillars for us are very clear i mean culture is like the bedrock and uh, i've often seen that when an organization gets created you will have multiple things like you'll say there's a, there's a organization structure there's a technology structure this is the way we are going to go out and borrow money but no one ever fine tunes the culture stack it is left to you know if it is just left to evolve and whether you articulate it or you don't articulate it the every organization has a culture so would you like to take a punt on saying here are five things which are non negotiable so what are those five things and in order to reach those five things who are you going to recruit what's kind of with the training how will your processes work so that's the it's in my opinion that's the basic cornerstone right uh, yeah. second is a lot about you know uh, the constant communication you will do in line with your culture uh which is your to town halls open house listening bottom up top down yeah. etc uh third would be growth prospects people want to grow what growth means for your team you will have to identify and then accordingly make that happen growth is also in my opinion encompasses learning last not, but not the least your leadership because the leadership will in in many ways evangelize these all yeah. these five so if all these few things are kind of articulated uh you're checking them constantly happiness would be an outcome so yes it can be it is a system uh it has to work very unobtrusively in the background it's not a policy rule book which can be showed yeah. every time that here's the yeah. formula employees should feel it but no one should see it so that's how it needs to work you know uh, the openness of the work culture that you know that that we have you know i think people are there is an openness the rigidness has gone away over the years you know at the workplace the openness has made it uh, much more happier workplace currently. definitely definitely uh, one of our value employee value propositions is called whole self so we say you need to bring your whole self to work you don't have to try and be someone yeah. else we've hired you for you so come into the workplace and become behave like you and the talks of, like that talk that diversity every individual is different and uh, if or, or the workplace doesn't offer that openness people will come in and pretend to be someone else and pretend that puts a lot of pressure that people are best when they are able to be themselves they operate to the maximum potential and productivity if you are constantly watching over your shoulders to try and be someone else you're not going to be productive so i would say openness is an amazing way uh, it's added to the amount of fun it adds to happiness because it lets people be who they are great great talking to you ruhi you know you. and that was a very lovely conversation i really liked your thoughts so thank and it was great interacting with you thank you so thank was, you so much for having me over yeah you have a good so day. that was Bye. ruhi you know sharing her happiness questions with us and how she practices happiness at her workplace thank you everyone bye thank you ruhi. thanks bye, bye.